Oh, okay. Can't record? It's recording here now. Um.
Hölle. So are you streaming this live? Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. And recording it too, so that they have it for... So as an archival... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that everyone can see it. Very cool. You're so like official over here with your computer and your I'm just, camera. I'm just trying to make sure that everything gets done the way that they want it to. Because I just kind of jumped in like, in the middle of the week and I'm like, oh. I thought like, because like, maybe it's a little more and text stuff. I'm like, oh, I'm going to text it. It's like, no, don't ice cream in the tweet. I'm just like, oh, okay. I think that's way cool that you're doing that. It's fine. It's yeah. Fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. All right. That you're using like your, you know, your savvy. Smart, La Ramona. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I just really, cu I really was curious to see like what people had to say and what people had to say and the conversation about. For me, it's like I'm an actor, mm -hmm. so I want to know how I can have opportunities to work with other people besides that. Guy. You know, and how can I get into it? How, what opportunities are being offered for actors like me? Audition to be part of this other kind of thing. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. And networking. It's networking too. Knowing Your people's. No, I think that's great. I think this is a really good event. I'm very proud of everybody who's kind of put it together. And you know, I've been kind of looking to be like part of the conversation. I don't want to talk. I want to do. You know, that's my whole thing. I had dinner with April last night, and you know, she's telling me I was coming to her. She feels the same way. She's like, I don't want to talk so much, but at some point, let's start doing shit. Yes. I'm happy to see that you know, Eddie came. Tough is being represented as well. And you're a part of Casa TV. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Which is great. Which is great. I'm surprised there's a thing that I'm going to Oh! Oh! Okay. That's why. Okay. Okay. In that case, la perdono. We're not on. Cool. Oh, I'm glad, Miss Eki.
I do want to mention that we are live streaming on HowlRound.tv. Uh, and uh, we're tweeting using the hashtag Latino Theater, uh, Latino Alliance Now. Hashtag Latino Alliance Now was up here um, just before we started. So you just pound sign Latino Alliance Now. Uh, for those of you watching on Haram.tv, uh, you can tweet your questions. Ramona is tweeting um, right now. She's live tweeting to ask her questions to the panels um, this morning. Uh, and, and in the room, you can keep the conversation going on Twitter throughout the day. Uh, feel free to like, tweet things that are going on up here, and, and let's keep the conversation going on the online platform that now exists. So, um, I did want to address the big list and how shows ended up on the list. Um, that was the first question that the cohort you know, really wrestled with, was that big question, you know, what is the state of Latino theater, was the onus that we took on for today's event. And then, you know, within that, what is Latino theater? How do we identify a show as Latino theater? So um, there's a mix, and it's an ever-evolving, um, you know, Latino is an ever-evolving uh, word. We, as an example, we went from Chicano theater, from the movement, to now Latino theater. And um, within that Latino identity, we're, of course, multi-ethnic, and uh, coming from all sorts of backgrounds. And the, the big list comprises of, you know, shows with big Latino casts, well, first we, we included the shows from the, the companies. So the identified Latino companies in the, in the community, we first grabbed their seasons, and then uh, independent artists, if they were creating and, and putting up a show, for example, Jose Casa at the Fringe, we included uh, Chevy 57. And, um, you know, plays written by non-Latinos, motherfucker with a hat, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also included um, we didn't include any international, so we're, we're, that might be room for us to grow in that direction. Um, is Latin American theater being produced in, in Los Angeles? I just wanted to address that before we jump into the scholars cohort, which is uh, born out of you know, the historical context, and they're looking at the plays in that, in that respect. Thank you so much, Armando. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such a historical uh, occasion. And very exciting uh, to have you all with us today. We're going to be discussing the plays in the chronological order in which they were produced in the season. And in our conversation, we're, we're going to be looking at three things. Major themes, what we found most relevant about the work and significant, and how the work speaks to the evolving trajectory of U.S. Latino drama. Uh, we're also going to, we're individually going to talk about plays that we saw, but we're also going to have moments in the conversation where we talk about, collectively, about three uh, key works that we saw together. And as we open discussion of each play, we're going to ask for a show of hands of who saw, how many people saw the play, so we can kind of have a, a living snapshot uh, as we go along to give us that information about uh, the audience. And uh, we'll be responding to <coughs> questions via Twitter, but also live, uh, question comments you have. So we ask you to just um, benchmark or write down your questions so that we can come to them at the end. And in your uh, purple uh, packet of materials, you'll find a one sheet that we put together with uh, all the titles of all of the productions and the production information so that you can use that to follow along as we uh, talk individually about each of the works. So just to jump off of what um, Tiffany said, in the list for our scholar panel, we're addressing 12 plays. So we only have an hour, so we also have to condense. We, as we said, there were 28 plays that we looked at over this certain period of time. Um, however, obviously, it's very difficult for everyone to see every single show. So the whole cohort made a, a collective effort to see as much as they could. So if there's shows that we're not addressing, they might be addressed in the artistic panel later in the day. So there's going to be some situation of what's addressed. Um, and if you've worked on a piece that's not being addressed, we, we may have also seen it. So we may take questions you know, um, in the different panels. You're welcome to raise questions like that. But just to give you an idea, if you don't see a particular show in this um, presentation, we did limit it to 12 for time, and also pieces that we felt we really needed to speak about, and that we all had seen, or some of us. 
Um, we're going to begin talking with the first play of the season, uh, Faith, by Amina Fernandez. And Faith, part one. <laughs> so the full title is Faith, part one of a Mexican trilogy by Amina Fernandez. Uh, can we have a show of hands and how many people saw this show? <laughs> Thank you. Um, some of the themes, uh, we want to begin by talking about the themes that were presented in the show that we think are very significant, thinking about U.S. Latino drama, which is themes about family, history, Americanness, Americanness, uh, coming of age, different perspectives on war, uh, I think the need for self-expression through prayer, song, homemaking, labor, thinking about all of those things as a form of self-expression. Uh, not just survival or uh, gender, gen found in gender roles. And also significantly, this is a play about cli the climate of war and how it shapes the generations of a family, but in particular as represented through the voices of women. And I think that that's something that's extremely powerful about the play, is it's looking at all of those themes through the voices of the women in the family. Uh, it's the first in uh, Fernandez's trilogy about the impact of war on generations of family and uh, looks at, and one of the artistic things that is significant about the work is music as a central part of the play, and not just as interludes, but really as part of what drives the action in the work. And uh, another key part of the play is watching the evolution of the women characters. We talked about the coming of age, but you see the intergenerational relationships as the women struggle, and one of the things I found particularly significant about the evolution of the representation of women in our plays is, yes, there's girlfriends, there's wives, there's mothers, there's grandmothers, but these characters aren't just static satellites around male characters. They're actually very uh, multivalent, extremely complex, and you see the uh, ways that there is um, in intergenerational conversations, especially through the daughter and the grandmother and how all of those um, relationships play out in very complicated ways. Um, and then if this is an American play, it's also situating itself as what it means to be not only Chicano, but to be American through a Chicano perspective, and that's particularly linked to uh, the, each of the characters voicing their thoughts about how they feel about war and the stakes that they feel should and shouldn't be uh, engaged in about war and watching the, the relationships between the women and the men and how they go off to war and who's at home and how war is and isn't supported. Um, Jorge brought up in our conversation that when uh, Valdez situated Zoot Suit as an American play at the time, he was very much uh, uh, resoundingly criticized for that. So it's very interesting when we look at the evolution of the works in the season a consistent theme, uh, Chantel pointed this out in our conversation, there's a consistent theme of saying not only are we Latino, but we also uh, are part of the American cultural landscape and history. So those are some of the uh, uh, different uh, themes that we saw in the play and some of the, the points that I thought were particularly sig significant around history, family, culture, and the voices of women as carrying forward that conversation. And that's also part of a, a trilogy. Just to jump off of that trilogy, so if um, those maybe who are not familiar with the rest of the trilogy, um, the other ones are Hope and Charity, so it's Faith, Hope, and Charity. But um, I love the story behind it. Um, in Evelina's house growing up, there were three framed photos, and one was of FDR, um, Pope John Paul II, or whoever the current Pope was, and Kennedy, JFK. And so each play is, they sort of take that that signature feature and that person as a launching point. And so all of these are major moments in American history and we explore how this uh, multi-generational Latino family. So it's an epic trilogy that really looks at the Mexican-American experience in the US. Um, also created out of this anti-immigrant sentiment of, of what was happening in Arizona a few years ago that continues to be happening, that situates us as non-American. And so this is sort of a theatrical intervention against that, um, that negative and from, uh, from now we're going to segue to our group conversation about mo the motherfucker with the hat by Stephen Alden Burgess. 
by pronunciation. <laughs> okay, and how many of you saw Mother Fucker? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so far, it looks, like, it looks like at least 50% of this wonderful audience has seen the plays we're talking about, which is wonderful because it means we are all supporting each other. Uh, this play is a very well-written play focusing on Latinos and Latinos and one African-American character, for those of you who did not see it. it. It does this with humor and insight into addictions of all kinds. I felt that the characters were, were well-rounded, although they could have developed into stereotypes in the wrong artist's collective hands. Betrayal is a major theme, but the problems are all internal. In other words, there are no outside forces causing the disarray. The characters have created their own predicaments. Perhaps the one exception is the gay cousin who relates how his childhood, in his monologue, how his childhood was marred by homophobic uh, friends, boys, in the neighborhood. This touching monologue saved his character from being yet another swishy Latino and brought another theme, an important theme, that of the LGBT community in addition to the play. The witticisms in the text kept the audience attentive, including all of the gray hairs older than me, uh, Angles in the audience. <laughs> all of us wondering what the next surprise was going to be. The idea of a hat at the center of attention as well as a sexual intrigue reminded me of a much earlier 19th century farce, French farce, the Italian straw hat, which some of you may have read in your theater history classes. <laughs> but unlike, and I wasn't there, contrary to popular <laughs> conscious moments to consider, such as the relationships gone sour, the betrayal of the main character by his sponsor. You had some notes? Yeah. Um, I, well, to me, a central part of the play and reading it within the context of uh, Latino drama is uh, in the early 90s, the Chicago literary historian Francisco Lomeli introduced a term called the Chicanes. And he used it to talk about work by non Chicano writers that really attempt to authentically portray the Chicano experience. So for, for me, that is a term that I find really helpful to looking at this work. We have Short Eyes, it's a very important work in Latino theater, and I see this as part of the continuum and looking at how our communities have been shaped by the prison experience and looking at it through interpersonal relationships. And in a community where a man has gone off to prison, he comes out, and we see how he struggles to make his parole, stay sober. But what's also significant to me, thinking through um, my own investment and in representations of, of women on our stages, is that we see how the women are made to uh, go into prison with the men. Right, by providing financial support, emotional support, but coming out and really bearing heavy weight on how, what is their role going to be in making sure that their male partners don't, uh, that they're able to re-enter, but that they don't re-offend, and, and what kind of burdens the characters have to short around that. And also the intercultural relationship in the play around sponsorship and aid. So for me, thinking about just the crisis our communities are in, around prison issues right now, prison and education being uh, two pivotal issues, this play has been very, very significant for us to, to follow and think about and, and the story that it's telling. Uh, and I thought uh, the production, I was going to talk about uh, uh, the direction of it because I, I saw, I got to catch um, the recording of the Broadway cast and I really felt uh, John Michael Garces' direction and his casting of the Latina actor, actors in the role was just brilliant because it was so true to the script, their voluptuousness. Is, it's not um, uh, just a part of their character asset, it's a, a really intrinsic part of looking at how women work through their issues through their body and through food. And I really felt like a lot of the productions and casting of the women missed that as an organic part of the script. So, um, so uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it to Sean. So I sort of play the devil's advocate role in, in this uh, 
conversation. I really agree with both of them. It's an excellent play. It's very well written, um, and it's very funny, and I really appreciated the performances. But one of my major concerns was that I agree that these characters can very easily slip into stereotype, and that's something that we struggle with um, in any of our productions. Uh, but my, my concern was, given the visibility of this play at a major regional theater, under a Lord contract, we have um, actors of color working in these roles, which is fantastic, um, but that they're still playing addicts. Um, and what does that say, particularly in Orange County, in which the night that I went, I was probably one of the darkest people in the audience, and I'm not very dark. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was problematic for me, but, um, but that just raised a concern, and it's not to say that, that the play, uh, it's not anything against the play, but it's just something that I thought was important to talk about, and how, even in our own work, I was talking about Short Eyes, you know, which is written by a Puerto Rican author, how do we sort of grapple with the harsh realities of our communities uh, but what, what happens when we put that on a major regional stage um, and, and how our audience is reacting to that? And that might be beyond our control, but I thought perhaps um, in the discussion this might be something um, that other folks might want to chime in about. But that was sort of the wrestling concern I had. As much as I enjoyed the piece, I was sort of left thinking about, about these characters and, and what, does it, what does it mean that this is sort of a major representation of our communities out there. And uh, further, uh, those of you who study the history of uh, Latino Latino theater, as Tiffany points out, Short Eyes was the first play written by uh, a New Rican, uh, Miguel Pinero, and with a company, an inter, you know, uh, intercultural company, including Latinos, African Americans, and Anglos, directed by a Mexican Puerto Rican from New York. And it was a very successful play on Broadway in a prison, and the next successful play on Broadway by a Latino Wazutsu, which also takes place in prison. And then there was Cape Man, which is, a, you know, so uh, it, it seems that the dominant society wants to only represent us as prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> Science fiction. 
in the closing scene where the Chicano characters, who we know off stage in the cultural moment, were most likely derogatory referred to, derogatorily referred to as illegal aliens, exit to board a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> the college students who accompanied me to the oh, this is you. Oh, I'm reading Tiffany. Oh, I ran out of my notes. I left off with memory. Okay, so let's switch it over to Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> so what he read was uh, was uh, my thoughts, but our thoughts are always working together. So I'm I'm happy about that. Um, I, I, to me, what was really significant was seeing uh, one of our classic plays staged this season, uh, as Jorge mentioned, um, this season CTG uh, staged two classics of African American theater, uh, Joe Turner and Raising the Sun. Those audiences were, audiences were full, they were riveted, it was very powerful to see those classics and to see them uh, uh, situated as classics of American theater as well as classics of, classics of African American I feel like we need to see that on our stages too. So to me, that was what was extremely powerful about this production. I think the other thing that was powerful was I took with me several uh, students that I teach to see the production, and they were riveted by it. It it was it took them back and allowed them to put things together about thinking about issues of representation, but they were also thinking how that it brought them closer to understanding their Chicano parents and the struggles they went through. Um, but they also artistically loved it, how it was uh, doing something different artistically on the stage with playing with Brechtian themes and the, the gesture to the science fiction and, uh, and other things. And then I think the final thing uh, for the students that I, that I spoke with after the show, that they were just very inspired by learning that there are classics that are the backbone of our theater tradition. So those, those are the key things that were very important to me about that play in addition to um, just what it explores and it's about, but just the work of seeing the traditional uh, and classic works in our theater tradition. So just to piggyback off of that, I agree completely that the themes of media representation as well as generational differences and a young Chicano's identity crisis are still really relevant today, particularly in the advanced degree setting. We have Sunny going into Harvard, um, and having been a Latina in advanced degree, there is a sense of cultural alienation that I think the play really does capture um, very well. Um, one of the other elements that I really love about this play is that Valdez doesn't shy away from showing us that Latinos have their own prejudices as well. Buddies, um, comments about um, Japanese Americans, Asian Americans, sort of lumping them all together, talking about dog count, you know, all these things we see how we have our own internal prejudices outside of the brown white binary, that it's not just about Latinos against the dominant white culture or anything like that, but that amongst ourselves we have um, sort of issues with other cultures or, or there's sort of misunderstandings with other cultures. Um, and so I really appreciated that. And also we get a glimpse of a little bit of homophobia in this play in which Buddy thinks, uh, you know, they're concerned that Sonny's coming out to them and when and he's and that that's even worse than whatever he could have said. That could have been the worst thing to happen would be Sonny coming out as gay. And so it's a really comedic moment, but at the same time really spoke to me about generational um, differences and viewpoints um, with, within um, LGBT community and, and the Ch Chicano community. Um, in terms of gender representation, I struggle a bit with this play. Um, I appreciate the Asian American love interest, and I think she's there to sort of represent a multicultural America, but at times she sort of, for me, doesn't have the same complexities that Sunny does. Um, but nevertheless, all of her struggles really reinforce these generational issues. She's struggling with um, Japanese cultural uh, gender norms in her family, and also the fact that she was in a, um, a relationship with an African American male that was looked down upon from her family. Um, but the last thing I'd like to point out, going back to what is the topic of the invisible Mexican, um, I find it problematic that in, this is the first play that I know of in which we have a Latina character who's an advanced degree. Sunny's sister is a doctor. She's gone through school successfully, but she's invisible. We never see her in the play. She's outside, and she's depicted as fat and mean and horrible. Um, you know, and it's very comedic, and she serves a comedic purpose. But that, um, you know, that for me shows. Um, where sort of where we've come from, and some of the later plays we're dealing with um, deal with the feminine in a, in a more maybe um, sophisticated manner. So. Which, which is ironic that Mr. Valdez, who at the time he was beginning to do La Bamba, he was going to be making La Bamba when this play was first produced. One, 
remember that it was first produced in the mid 80s, and, and the homophobia that existed then was far greater than we still have. Uh, I don't know about your parents or your grandparents, how happy they would be if you came out uh, of the so called closet. The other interesting <laughs> thing about the play is that it investigates that whole, the, the, the invisibility, you know, and that's something that, we, that pervades so many of our, of our plays. We want a voice, as I said a little earlier, and that's why we're here. Okay, the next one, the next play, Andrew, that's your voice. Okay, so, <laughs> so you, yeah, we're up here. Okay, you are going to have a voice. We're going we're gonna to proceed a little more quickly. The next play is one that I saw uh, in La Salida de Tormes at the Bilingual Foundation of the Arts. How many of you saw La Salida de Tormes? See, this is interesting. The further we go, the fewer hands. Okay, so. So you missed out. <laughs> you missed out on a very important moment because this this is uh, I saw it in Spanish and uh, with a, a huge cast and super titles in English. The audience was overflowing, a busload of students and everybody just was right there with it. It's a classic. La Salida de Tormes was, was written in the seventeen in the in fifteen fifty four and it was written anonymously because of the theme. It, the thematics are just as important today as they were back then. This is an original adaptation by Lina Montalvo and the director, Margarita Galvan, in which we are exposed to the corruptions in the Roman Catholic Church. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> we are exposed to a number of issues, the selling of indulgences, you know, to, to save your soul, la la la. We just read about the new, the new uh, sainthoods. Uh, from the Vatican, um, political intrigues, machismo, and finally, the, the main character, Lazario, is, is the original Picaro, who becomes the pelado in the evolution of Mexican, <coughs> Mexican uh, culture and, and uh, popular culture, Cantin Plus being the most successful of the pelados. But there were a lot of others performing carpas, so this goes to the Teatro Campesino and their uh, representations of the pelados. And so he lives from day to day and hand to mouth in Lazario. Uh, just like the farmers who were protesting and performing in the fields in 1965 and onward. So it has a lot of relevance to today's audiences and yet it's a Spanish classic. And the important thing here is that we have denied our Spanish heritage in so many of our of our voices, you know. Uh, here we were uh, you know, speaking Spanish, trying to try and speak Spanish, uh, denying English, being as bilingual as we could, but we never recognized that Spanish came from Spain, and uh, we need more of our authors, I think, to investigate those Spanish, Moorish, Jewish roots that we have. So we're going to move now to our last group conversation, and then we'll um, the rest of the presentation will be individual um, discussions about the place. But this piece is um, we're going to move to Melancholia by the Latino Theater Lab, produced by the Latino Theater Company. Um, I'd like to mention too that this piece involves al almost all or most of the Vault Ensemble, which is um, a, a, divide, a group that does divide work out of the Los Angeles Theater Center. Um, so this was a collaboration, and it was originally done in 2007. In 2007, I went to Edinburgh Bridge Festival, and we brought it back um, to the LATC in this season um, because we felt there had been so much happening in investigating PTSD. Um, and soldier suicide, veteran suicide, and particularly through a Latino lens. Um, yeah, so, you know, as the historian uh, here of Chicano theater, the theme of Chicanos and war has been a subject for Chicano theater and playwrights since the beginning of war. But since the beginning of the Chicano theater movement with the Teatro Campesinos, very, very classic and still performed, or should be performed, Vietnam Campesino and Soldado Raso, in 70 and 1971. So this theme, so it, those were actos. They were street theater, they could be performed anywhere. The interesting thing about this piece, Melancholia, which is also collectively written, the actors did a, a lot of ethnographic theater with the subject of PTSD, which had not been identified in the 70s as PTSD. When I was growing up at, after World War II, it was called, uh, what is Shell it? Shock. Shell shock, you know, and etc. And it deals with something that has very you know, that has not been discussed and is a super important and, and terrible issue of the military veterans and in the military committing suicide. So the issues have been with us and this play adds to that in a very, very distinct way. Tiffany? Um, for me this was a really uh, incredibly powerful work for all of those reasons, but also artistically, the way that they were using the 
uh, the staging, the costuming, the makeup, to very much underscore the critical engagement that they were making with PTSD and get, having the audience really viscerally discern uh, the crisis points around trauma that are so unspoken. So for me, I was thinking about Grand Bunyol, but also just zombies. They're coming out in their white makeup and making us see how if we don't talk about these issues or, or we become inculcated with no critical thought about uh, issues of trauma and war that, that we're like zombies culturally. Uh, and the people with trauma who can't articulate and work through PTSD, that they do, they feel like they're walking in a half-life. So I felt, felt like artistically uh, the staging of the work was incredibly powerful. And just the conversation about trauma, that uh, it wasn't just an individual, a call to look at an individual story about trauma, but really looking at how as a culture and a community and as a family, we all need to be educated and aware of uh, helping to intercede and heal our members and, and to talk about this. We just don't have enough public conversation about it. So this is an incredibly uh, wrenching work for me, important artistically as well as thematically. I forgot to ask how many of you saw him in Okay, thank you. So just a couple more topics. Again, I think this piece really resonates in a piece that tries to situate the Latino experience as an American experience, particularly when we have soldiers dying for this country and then coming back and not um, sort of being supported um, by their communities, by the, by the larger government. Um, and so really situating that through a Latino lens. And I think it was really um, interesting to use three actors as the one central character of Mario. So we, can't, we see not only his sort of um, fractured psyche, but also that this is anyone. This is all of you know all of our soldiers. We have um, in an ensemble cast that's multicultural in this cast, so we don't have just Latino you know, actors, which I think is really important and exciting. Um, and we see female sort of soldiers represented, um, and we also see glimpses into the family and how the family has to deal with not knowing who this person is that has come back from war. Sort of this shift in identity um, is really important, and I think similar to Soldado Raso. Um, Stylistically, we have sort of that the muerte makeup that we see, but it's, it's done universally through all of the characters. Um, the character of La Muerte is also coming from our theatrical tradition, but we sort of elevated in this piece. There's elements of opera and really important and interesting stylistic choices. Um, but I think what I found really most important was sort of how it still looks at how the notion of machismo and masculinity proving manhood is crucial to Mario's decision to go into war and his family sort of asked him, what are you going to do? And he's dealing with all these pressures. That compounded with the military um, stylized sort of recruitment tactics. The, and we, in the play, it's done stylistically through part of song and dance, sort of theatrics, to bring in um, um, recruits. And particularly speaking to the fact that they're often recruiting in lower class, uh, you know, working class communities and looking for minorities to kind of be at the front of the line. So I think it really spoke to that, and it's a really scathing critique of the military-industrial conflict. Okay, we better move on. The next one is a smash cut at uh, the Frida Kahlo. Uh, how many of you saw the smash cut? Excellent, excellent. Um, this collage of brief scenes explored the young actors' lives. It was written and directed by Ruben Gatias in consultation with the young people in his uh, workshop, his acting workshop. The first monologue is performed by a young man who rolls on in his motorized wheelchair. Uh, wonderful, wonderful opening monologue. He asks, uh, why do I need legs when I have wings to fly? And fly he does, taking us on a roller coaster ride through his young life with spinodipity. Spinodipity. I couldn't even find that in the dictionary. Thank you. He does not ask for pity nor do any of the other members of this wonderful, youthful, creative, talented ensemble, which also includes a blind, an African-American blind actor, singer. In two acts and several scenes, these young people demonstrated their aesthetic and political awareness, recalling early Chicano theater actors, condemning the wars as, quote, just another lie by politicians and other topical references. A standout scene, I thought, consisted of two cholos Dissecting Reagan's trickle down theory. <laughs> it is absolutely delightful. Totally destroying any stereotypes about Cholos being uneducated and 
a political. The program also included singing and dancing and a wonderful discourse on the joys of graffiti tagging. So we're going to move along um, to the next production we're looking at um, is The Anatomy of Gazelles by Janine Selena Schoenberg. And this is one of the pieces, how many people have not So this is one of the pieces in which we sort of discuss, okay, is it Latino theater um, if it's not produced by a Latino theater um, you know, organization? And of course it has a Latino author and it dealt with the whole um, cast of seven Latino women. And so we thought, you know, of course we have to sort of uh, speak about the fact that these plays are being done by non-Latino entities, that our, our, that our work is, and our issues are important to groups of theater that aren't ethnically specific per se. So Playwright Karina is dedicated to LA authors, and so that's how the relationship with Janine uh, Selena Schoenberg came about. Um, and so Gazelle follows a pregnant suicidal teenager, Alex, as she escapes her abusive, meth-addicted mother and embarks on a journey in search of her grandmother, a woman she believes to be a powerful shaman. Um, two spirit guides, as you see with her, um, join her on this quest, and they take the shape of very feisty drifters. Um, on the eve of a great storm, uh, Alice pulls up at a halfway house for uh, young ex-con women. So again, we see um, women who've been in a juvenile detention center or, or have done time. In this case, we see it from the female perspective. Um, but again, the issue of sort of prison is coming up um, in these plays. She goes to a halfway house basically run by an evangelical minister who turns out to be her grandmother. That's sort of the major plot twist at the end. Um, but I think this play really deals with several issues. I think it's important that we have a cast of all women, all Latina characters exploring um, this path. And the play has one foot in magical, sort of magical realism, one, sort, one foot in the magic, and one foot in reality. Um, although the two sort of never intertwine. We sort of see these two worlds remain separate. Um, and I think that this play speaks to sort of this nature of women sort of doing time. Um, in prison or awaiting um, their, their significant others in prison. Some of the characters have relationships with people in prison and they're sort of sitting doing time uh, on their own. Uh, for me, one of the most poignant, poignant themes was the tension between a spirituality based in the mythical and sort of indigenous uh, at odds with this evangelical um, ideology. And it speaks to sort of the um, their movement of, of evangelical sort of churches in, in Latin America and that they're popping up, they continue to pop up here, and then it becomes for, for Selena um, talking about how the evangelical storefront churches have become a space for community, particularly for new immigrants, and so then these, these women sort of find home in that space. Okay, the next play uh, is one that, uh, that I saw, Tamales de Puerco en Casa de Puerco. Uh, I believe this is, as the producers say, the first trilingual play performed in Spanish, English, and ASL, American Sign Language. Some of the actors are actually deaf or hearing impaired, others are not. The super titles were very effectively presented in both English and Spanish. When the deaf actors were signing without an interpreter, the super titles told us what they were saying. It's a, a very complicated plot, uh, a, a bit melodramatic, telenovelista. Uh, when the main character finds out that her son is baby, her infant son is profoundly deaf, the husband refuses to acknowledge, and uh, she has to leave him. He's an abuser, and etc. So it's all about deafness, and, and this is what the playwright is trying to bring to the fore. The audience was SRO, very multicultural. It was obviously a mixture of hearing and <coughs> non-hearing uh, audience members. She falls in love, she's left the husband, she falls in love with a, a street singer. She becomes a tamale vendor, tamale de puerco, uh, and, and makes friends with a wonderful elote vendor sitting right there. <laughs> Do you know? Are we going to have any elotes out there for us? The Absolutely. Yeah. Delightful, delightful characterizations. Uh, a complicated plot that to, to sum it up, because we don't have a lot of time, the plot, and the, the story ends, the husband comes back, and he has gone away and disappeared, and she, he starts to beat her, and so she hits the husband on the head with a baseball bat, killing him. Uh, the two of them, the two street vendors, determine that they should cook his body and make tamales out of it, and this is what they do. <laughs> and the last scene is them on the street selling sork tamales, which is soy pork, uh, culturally relevant, and tamales de puerco, the dead husband being the puerco that they are. <laughs> and the audience
audience loved it. When the actor playing the Puerco came on stage for a curtain call, they all booed him. <laughs> That's how successful a villain he was. It is a thin plot. I'm looking at the thematics here, but I'm also looking at the structure. And yet, and yet, it, it will have a life. It does need more work. Uh, it needs to be cut, but it, it is uh, a very, very important statement. One of the first, as I say, I don't know of any other place from our community, that Chicano here, he's dealing with deaf members of the family. That's a, that's a wonderful uh, segue into talking about uh, issues that we really were trying to press to the forefront that are, that are uh, at the first. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, Elizabeth Sekeresh's When Song Leaders Go Bad. It's actually uh, one woman show that's part of a larger trilogy uh, uh, of work called Slip of the Tongue by West of Fire Machina Theater Ensemble <laughs> with uh, Christina Nava and uh, Sarah Guerrero. And uh, the collaborative work that all uses humor to look at uh, struggles of uh, violence and abuse and uh, violence, violence and abuse and gender oppression, including rape, drug addiction, the impact on family and children. And then with Sekrish's piece, uh, the emotional and financial struggles that accompany the arduous journey of working, of the working poor to diagnose and treat bipolar disorder. Uh, and the play portrays a woman's experience with bipolar illness from its undiagnosed emergence during her adolescence to the struggle for treatment during adulthood. She performs the piece dressed in a cheerleader's costume, uh, and the song leader illustrates the frenetic scale of mania as she you know, charges her cheers with energy that dramatically slides from the shrill heights of triumph to uh, the dark lows of defeat as she tells the story of her, her attempted attempts at self-medication, her engagement with alcohol abuse, and just her ongoing quest to get find diagnosis and treatment. Um, and through her care, through this song leader character, she really, with the crazy energy and presence that she brings to the stage, she's really trying to make us understand what somebody who lives and suffers with bipolar disorder goes through with this constant sliding of energy. It's it's uh, it's grueling and it's exhausting to watch it. And she wants it to be that way so that we understand what she's gone through. It also talks about alcohol, alcoholism and really how uh, intertwined that is with bipolar conditions. And during the play, she has a, um, a, a white paper that she is consistently sharing statistics with the audience about bipolar condition and its relationship to um, a, a drug and alcohol abuse. And then I, I think uh, the play also asks us to consider some very stark questions, which is how do we diagnose it, how do we treat it, but also how do we obtain ongoing uh, medical treatment for it. And Sekeresh is very frank in talking about the expense, but the struggle to maintain uh, her medical treatment. So it's a great piece. It's getting a lot of uh, it's getting a lot of showcasing. It's touring to uh, universities and colleges a lot to start the conversation and it was recently uh, spotlighted as part of the Mer Medical Manners Conference. So again, it's an example of how our theater can be used to uh, make social interventions through work that's very artistically well considered and well done. And just, I don't know if we did, how many people did see oh. the What Time Leaders Go Back? Okay, great. Uh, and we're going to move on. We have three more um, quick plays to cover. Um, the next is Wild of Wichita by Lena Gallego for the Bible of How many people show hands on Wild of Wichita? Great. If you did not see Wild of Wichita, it's coming to Los Angeles Theater Center um, this fall season. Uh, it'll start playing in October. So, can I ask how many of you saw Locuras? Locuras in Wichita is a bilingual so production. You saw it in Spanish. And then the others saw Wild and Wichita. So I'll be discussing the English play, but it's really about the play thematics, um, so not so much about the different casting or the production. Um, but Wild and Wichita is really a charming comedy that explores many themes relevant to the Latino theater, the Latino community and beyond. Um, when two aging Latinos, Carmela and Joaquin, find themselves as the only Spanish speakers in a nursing home in Wichita, Kansas, the sparks fly and romance blossoms. 
uh, Lina Gallegos play explores love in the golden years, while also highlighting the diversity between Latinos. We see a lot of bickering sort of between the Puerto Rican uh, woman and this Mexican American man, debating the differences in their speech, accent patterns, um, the food, dancing and music, um, and so very sort of charming exploration of how we have our differences, but we find commonality, and some of the ways they find commonality is in their shared language. The, the spoken Spanish language is what they find in Kansas as their site of community. Uh, and the feeling of being away from home. In this case, their home is not necessarily Puerto Rico or Mexico, but rather Brooklyn and Texas. And so again, we have these characters that are U.S. Latinos and that their home and their culture is rooted um, in the U.S. Um, and, oh, the play also explores the generational differences again between them and their children. The reason why they're there is because their children have very hectic professional lives and they can't sort of give them the care that they need. Um, and so again, we see this issue of how our generations are dealing with um, elderly care and, and how can our community sort of deal with that situation. Um, and again, we see the theme of mental health arise, which surprisingly really came up in almost all of the shows that we're looking at, issues of mental health, which is a predominantly taboo subject in the Latino community and other communities, but it's starting, I think theater artists are starting to use um, you know, this is a platform, and we see Carmela's long-term um, anxiety and depression threatens to keep the two apart um, after Joaquin suffers a uh, heart attack, but they are able to sort of reconnect. Um, but it really looking sort of at, at mental health um, is another major theme for the play. Also important to note that in this case, too, uh, she's a teacher. She's a retired uh, grammar school teacher, and he had his own hardware store, small business in Texas, until Pinche Home Depot moved in. <laughs> Another, another uh, way to show how the middle class is part of our uh, ongoing themes. I'm gonna, the last play I'm going to be discussing is uh, Adelina Anthony and Delo's The Beast of Time. How many people know it? Really fabulous the show. So Delo contributed one monologue and the, the play is mostly by Adelina Anthony. And uh, Anthony wrote the play in response to a series of newspaper articles that she read about the crisis of a trapped dolphin and the issues it raised for her community. And she was struck by the way the news articles kept using the fraught language used with Latinos and immigration, like anchor baby, and, uh, uh, border crossers, and she was very uh, appalled by this. The play is set in a world post the latest world crisis, which she says it's today, and focuses on the journey of cat and dog as they come into political consciousness as the pets of a lesbian couple <laughs> the, the play is driven by humor and comedy to explore matters of identity politics through sketches featuring various animals uh, who comment on how human intervention has compromised their quality of life. <laughs> Pollution, forced sterilization, colonization. These are clearly positioned as allegories that serve as modern day fables. The production has a minimalist approach and style. The set, is, for example, the set is comprised of an old trunk with a giant stuffed dog on top of it. There's different items that are preset on the stage, including a huge dog bowl and a giant copy, I mean, massive copy of Cherry Robbins' bridge called My Bag. Um, the actors are dressed in coveralls, and their animal characterizations come about through physical interpretation and small costume pieces with their testimonial monologues consistently breaking the fourth wall. In this way, uh, it's a work that clearly stands in conversation with the traditions of Chicano, the Chicano Acto and Atchikrop Theater. Um, there's a real important politics to this play, which is all the box office proceeds went to the support of queer and transgender homeless youth. Um, so it was very, very powerful to go into that audience and to see this work and know where the box office proceeds were going. And I was uh, incredibly uh, struck by the diversity of the audiences, but I had the privilege of being there on the closing night when there was a huge met section of the audience that were youth, I'm presuming, uh, involved in this program. And it was very, very powerful to see their response to this work and how it was clearly inspiring them to think about uh, the own st the stories that they might have to tell. And there's a lot of, you can see from the production still, it's, it's hysterical, it's constantly riffing on uh, uh, hip hop and popular culture. 
it's, it's uh, very funny. The last thing I want to mention about this is it's the swan song of both artists in that I thought it was the top of their artistic work, and they both declared to me that this was their, that they were leaving the theater to focus full time on filmmaking, and they're in the middle of a campaign to raise money to make a film version of Adam and Anthony's um, uh, Losing for Vessels. So um, I think that raises another question about just the, uh, the work that's involved in being theater artists and about the tension between the recognition of uh, film and, and this town industry. So the final play that we're going to talk about uh, is Hungry Woman by Cooking America. <laughs> How many people? Uh, and we have some of the actors here, the cast is here as well. Um, this is directed by Corky Dominguez. Um, I have to say, Uno Cero Uno. It's adapted from Lopez's novel, Hungry Woman in Paris. Uh, and it follows the journey of Canela, a Mexican American journalist, who, after losing her beloved cousin Luna to suicide, ends her engagement and decides to move to Paris. Um, the play really focuses on her journey of self discovery in cooking school while she struggles with her family's disapproval and, and these sort of um, gender norms that are being placed on her by her family. Um, and some of the major themes that work in this play, oh, again, we see the issue of suicide, uh, depression, and mental health. We have an interesting perspective on immigration, being that we have a U.S. Latina who then becomes undocumented in France. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, for me, a really important issue is sexual freedom, women's sexual freedom. I found the play, I think, took major risks, especially being in, in Boyle Heights with the, with the audience that, you know, a community-based audience that comes to these shows to see a really sort of risk Take risk taking in the portrayal uh, and the actualization of sexual freedom for a female Latina was really inspiring to see. Um, and, the, and also resisting sort of heteronormativity. We see Canela break off her engagement twice, and ultimately at the end of the play, she does not have a partner. She's not married, she's a single woman, and that that's okay, and, and that she doesn't have to sort of be partnered up. Um, and the, this sort of comes about through a really interesting sort of grief dynamic. Her mother throughout the play is constantly pressuring her to get married or to go back, but it's only through her becoming blind that she then see that her daughter is unhappy in this regard. Um, and the mother is great brilliantly um, in this great comedic uh, way, and, and then she becomes blind through uh, complications of her diabetes, and then she suddenly sort of realizes that her daughter is unhappy, so it gives her sort of the green light to break off the engagement with a very successful Latino. So that was a really interesting dynamic for me. Uh, again, we see the character of La Calaca or La Muerte playing a significant role in this piece that harkens back to our, our Chicano theater roots. Um, and with so many plays working to portray the Latino experience as American, I think it's really interesting we have this U.S. Uh, Latina who leaves the U.S. in the Bush era, trying to escape and not able to sort of deal with what was going on here and during the Bush administration. Um, and so she sort of is in a privileged position to leave the country. And she realizes this privilege, I think, when she meets two other immigrants in France. She meets a Colombian woman who's really struggling, trying to stay in France, um, as well as a Turkish Muslim woman who's trying to escape a harsh uh, marriage that she's in. And she sort of really comes to understand her perspective and even says, you know, maybe I don't have it so bad in the U.S. and that at least I'm treated in, in, with a certain degree of respect, a certain degree. So she understands sort of this issue in relation to other immigrant women's um, issues. And lastly, again, we have another play that deals in the trilingual area with, we have English, Spanish, and French. So it's a really sort of refreshing um, piece. Okay. So I want to check on time, because I know we're over in for Q&A. It'll be starting. It's 11.15. I'm going 11.58. Yeah. Okay. So we have, yeah, you want to do like, a couple minutes, yeah, 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 five minutes of Q&A, if you guys have you know, any we questions. Started, yeah, yeah. We started late, <laughs> we started late, 10 minutes, so uh, we want to know, I mean, we're hoping that we've inspired some questions and comments, so take it away. Yeah. Okay, we'll here, yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I think the, the uh, Chicana-centered plays are like really, like, I really love that I'm noticing you're following the tradition of, um, like, an animal dua sort of, Outline of like is she how she really embraces the borderlands and all these plays are really like embracing that territory. And I think Samara Sapuesto is a great example because she you know she really wants to harness language um, as just a very interdisciplinary uh, topic. And I think all these plays do that in a, their own, own sort of language. Um, and that's really inspiring for me to see to see that like coming out into the 
forefront. And no one else, I, I think, can really put that up into theater. So that's all I need to say. Thank you. And you know, Diane. Uh, I want to talk about what a friend I have in a hat. Uh, in a hat? With a hat. <laughs> that Michael John Garcés was here, because I, I would love to talk to him about my feelings about the portrayal of women in, in his production. You have to remember that the Broadway production was directed by a woman, Anna Shapiro, and I felt that as a director, she protected the women much more than Michael did. Uh, and I would love to actually have that kind of conversation in our future meetings in a very uh, an emotional way, but just, Talk about aesthetics and talk about uh, these gender issues because um, uh, you know I think they're very important and um, and and how men perceive uh, women even as very conscientious and socially minded uh, directors. So and I, and I should say I didn't get I didn't get to see the Broadway production. I was going on you know what I saw at the recording. So you know I I real I really appreciate you bringing that because. Uh, I would have liked to have seen that. I'm, I'm thinking just about his his casting, the voluptuous very act. Cool. Yeah, very yeah. Cool. yeah. So that that was where I was coming yeah. from. But I really appreciate. Now I want to really know yeah. more about the difference. But thank you. Well, I wanted to um, just riffing a little bit of um, the mother of the question. Uh, you said earlier about how it felt like it, it, little, it was an all white audience sort of watching these people on stage. And I feel that that happens a lot, especially in Orange County, where any kind of ethnicity, you feel a little bit like you're sort of a pet project and put up every couple of years in rotation. You know, the Asian play, the Hispanic play, the, the black play, that's a different thing now. And I really felt that with this piece somehow. It was very pulled out, and, and it was a, a, oh, look at this, you know. It didn't have, it didn't seem to really, resonate with the audience except that they oh how interesting they are. Oh they're so interesting. You know what I mean? I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know what that was about or whether the audience had been engaged in a way that I thought was appropriate. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? I just, just want to quickly add on that. If you looked at this year um Southwest Rep's season and they also had Chamber by David Henry Mark mm -hmm. and there were some of the you know, in the Scramble that mm -hmm. series that they did that they are scramble. Well, but that leads me to basically what you're saying is that when we spot it, it's called Jews with an American thing, which indeed it is. And uh, we're still not considered Americans. We're just not. That's the bottom line. We're still fucking foreign. We're still exotic. And um, which is why we have to do things like this because we're still not part of it. But at the same time, then we continue to ghettoize ourselves. That's that same problem for 162,000 years. And I, I don't know how. I don't know how that gets solved, I don't know how we deal with that, but we're, we're, we're just not. A good many years ago, I did an evening of uh, I produced an Iron Chicago Music in Paris. And the greatest thing is that it was part of a three-day festival of American music. I was like, oh my God, we are Americans outside of here, but how do we change that perception? How do, how do we deal with that? Well, so we, you're in work. <laughs> I must say that all this process that we started a year ago, and now it's about this question. How to change the narrative of the American theater. And in order to do that, we have to know what the landscape is, and how we as, as people in the community, or people who have access to the mainstream, can start moving forward so we can change it. And I think it's a different conversation than it was at the Gardena, 20 years ago, or 25 years ago. I hopefully this conversation will focus in, hopefully, in the artistic work and the aesthetic work and how we have to move it out to become part of the narrative of the American theater. Maybe, Diane, Roger, you guys sang for her. And it was a Louis singer. Oh my God. And, and we, are talking, we are documenting all of this. You keep that in mind. It will be posted. It's interesting to me that most of these plays were in English, 
I think only Nasario was in Spanish, all the rest were in English. So, so Wichita, oh, the Wichita. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I just want to comment on that, how much of it is in English. Uh, it, it, uh, it just, it, it's, I search for plays, I'm always looking for plays, and we, we, we find a lot in Spanish. That is it's just a quick comment. <laughs>
don't want to be part of the camera. Okay, good, good. Can you take a break or do you have to...
second cut of this one. talk part. 
And, uh, and, but I have a lot of thoughts, and I might self-edit myself as I go, thinking, oh, this isn't pertinent. Also, there's some themes that we've already heard today that I'm going to be repeating. So just to let you know, maybe going into it a little bit more. But uh, I want to start with three, uh, 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 I want to tell you three stories that have hit me in the last few months. The first story takes place in 1973, Motown, Detroit, three brothers, black guys, musicians. They play rock and roll, not soul music, not rhythm and blues, but rock and roll. In fact, they don't really even play rock and roll. They play punk. <laughs> yeah, they play punk music. And this is before Lester Bangs, Rolling Stone Journalist even coined the phrase punk. They were the precursor to punk. So they're good, really good. Brilliant, in fact. Odd, hard to pigeonhole, but good. Record producers take them to record companies to get a deal. No one wants them. I mean, it's 1973, everyone wants Marvin Gaye. <laughs> Besides, they don't like their name. Doesn't matter, we'll get a deal, not changing our name, they say. Finally, they hook up with Clive Davis. He's a big time producer, right? He thinks they're amazing, innovative, wants to sign them. One thing though, you know, you need to change your name. <laughs> what? No way, we're not changing our name. It's part of the vision of the group. It's the name and the content of the songs, says Dave, older brother and visionary. So Death, the band, keeps the name Death <laughs> and their vision intact and loses the contract and in fact never gets a contract and their recordings, their tapes, stay in an attic storage bin for 40 years. Flash forward to a couple of years ago, and a young white record collector finds a 45 of death press back in the day. Now they only made 50. He listens. It's like the best rock and roll he's ever heard. That's what he says, and what all the other young white collectors say, the best rock and roll they've ever heard, and it's by three unknown black dudes from Detroit. In fact, it sells on eBay for $800. $800. It's a phenom, a discovery, a treasure. It goes viral. So one of the young guys calls up a friend, a young black kid who's a musician, and says, hey, want to listen to some music? You want to listen to this? And he listens, and he says, oh my god, it's the best rock and roll I've ever heard. <laughs> No, oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. That sounds like my dad and my uncles. So he calls his dad. Did you have a band called Death? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We did. Never went anywhere. Why didn't you tell me? The kid yells. Well, I didn't. Second story, <laughs> Sisto Rodriguez. Woo! Yeah. You heard it. Mexican guy, American boy from Detroit during the late 60s, Indio looking, dark, beautiful man with a beautiful talent and soul, a poet, an amazing songwriter, deep and resonant voice, releases a couple of albums from major producers, inspired, He's like James Taylor and Bob Dylan rolled into one with a little dash of Jose Feliciano. A real discovery, much excitement. Well, the albums go nowhere. All those anticipated royalties never appear. Sisto, for all intents and purposes, uh, 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 um, says, oh well, I tried, and he ends up working and supporting a family by doing demolition work. He basically, he's basically a laborer and loves it. So somehow, his records end up in South Africa. He's uh, in South Africa, and over 40 years, he gains a fan base. 
not just any fan base. In South Africa, he's bigger than Elvis. <laughs> really, this is true, but he doesn't know it back in Detroit. And he continues to live in the same humble house he has lived in, and he does hard labor. Across the world, he's got a cult following. But there in South Africa, no one knows if he's dead or alive. What? So, a record store owner goes on a mission to find him, and he does. They make a documentary, and Sisto Rodriguez, humble dude that he is, is taken to South Africa various times to perform to wild crowds of Afrikaners who can't believe that this folk hero who wrote about freedom and justice is there before their eyes. And Sisto gets on that stage and he performs like he never left, like his life in Detroit was a fraud, because this is who he really is, Sisto Rodriguez, superstar. <laughs> He goes back to his humble life in Detroit, demolishing buildings and walking through the brown stove like an apocalyptic prophet. Third story. About eight years ago, this horticulturist named Randy McDonald goes to Echo Park with his girlfriend. He's really admiring the lily pads. Back then, they were in good condition. <laughs> And he thought, gee, it'd be nice to have a cutting. But hey, that would be illegal. <laughs> what the hell? He goes to his car, gets out a hacksaw blade <laughs> that he happened to be carrying around for moments such as these. <laughs> and he saws a cutting from one of the lilies. And he takes it back to Reseda, where he has a nursery and he starts growing it to sell. The progeny of the Echo Park lily flourishes. Meanwhile, back in Echo Park, with a, uh, in Echo Park, the lilies and the park aren't doing so well. In fact, the lilies die and the lake is polluted. So they closed for renovation <laughs> two years ago. And the city is desperate. All the lilies have died, and it's such an iconic symbol of the park. What to do? So Randy McDonald to the rescue. He connects with the city, tells them that he has a bunch of plants, the progeny of the original Echo Park lilies. Well, how did you get them? Minor detail. <laughs> cheating or stealing. I am talking about strategic give and not giving in. I'm talking about having a little give in order to achieve your goal. Too many of us don't want to compromise our vision. And what I am doing here is acknowledging that all of you in this room today have vision. And what I am, uh, uh, and, and, and you wouldn't be here if you didn't. Contemporary Latino theater would not exist for 50 years without your vision. But so many of us hold on stubbornly to the fact, to the first draft. And I use that metaphorically. The Hackney Brothers were brilliant, obviously, and I would think that their goal was to have their music heard. Couldn't these smart guys who had vision come up with another name they, that, that would have been equal or more brilliant than death to satisfy themselves and the record companies while achieving their greater goal? I'm an ideas person. Everyone that has worked with me knows that. I get it from my dad, Jake Rodriguez, 
who was always calling me and saying, I have an idea, and I was like, oh my God, what now? <laughs> <laughs> and it was always some idea about circumventing my mother and trying to get her to do something she didn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, so in the spirit of my father, uh, I really enjoy pitching ideas. And I'm not hurt if you don't like my ideas, because I have another one. <laughs> and I'm kind of a pest with the ideas, and I know I'm annoying. But I've trained myself to just let them flow. I don't censor myself. So what I'm saying about Sam and the two other brothers is that they didn't trust that they would have a better idea. Believe and the ideas will flow. Give a little. For example, playwrights. We all know playwriting is about rewriting. If you don't know that, or if you are a playwright who refuses to rewrite, your career is reflective of that, and I am so sorry. Find people who you trust, whose work you admire, and who is admired by others, and seek their opinion. And I'm not talking about Boncha down the street. <laughs> and she really liked my play. <laughs> Honey, how many plays has Boncha seen? <laughs> you are a professional. Get a professional opinion. Now, I have to admit that sometimes I resent people who do give me those, even if I ask for them. Usually they want me to change something, and usually they are right. It will make my work better. So you are in control of your vision and believe that if you change your work with the goal of improving it, you will retain it. See stuff. Story two. Now the most talented artists, the most brilliant, the most natural, need drive, ambition, and a business sense. Now, you don't have to be the most talented the most beautiful, the best poet, the richest organization, have the best building, the most people working for you, but you do need drive and ambition. Don't be embarrassed by that or deny it. You have to be competitive. And being competitive is about excellence. Now, excellence is a tough word for me. Who determines who's excellent or not? When I was in the teatro, I had to act next to Socorro Valdez. <laughs> to this day, one of the two best actresses I have ever worked with. She, she was an inspiration. She was excellent. She could act like a man, better than a man, <laughs> do a backflip, and then let out a sorrowful wail that would chill your back. Really? But she burned out early, not interested in pursuing an artistic life. And me, the one with the tiny voice to balance the not-so-tiny body, who wasn't very deep, who mugged and overacted, had the career. I wasn't excellent. But I had drive, and I could sense that I had presence. So in order to raise the bar for myself, I had to change. And I did that by listening to people I trusted because I wanted a life in the theater so badly. Sisto, his take? If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. If the door is closed, I'll just go in the opposite direction and do something else. That was fine for him. But for me, and many of you, no. If the door is closed, you go around and you look for another door, and if you cannot find a door that is open, then you open one yourself, and you keep it open for others to go through. Amen. It's, it's the 
called Iron Lee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this dude, Randy McDonald, subverted the rules for the greater good. Right? And that is cool. Now, I've spent 18 years at a very large not-for-profit not, not, not organization. I can't even get it out! <laughs> And so many times I find myself resisting the tried and true ways. Because honestly, I am not interested in embracing the status quo, though I have worked at a, at a various a, a hardcore establishment. I, I commit private acts of subversion. <laughs> and I would and it would no longer be private if I shared them with you. <laughs> you can see that I cut all this <laughs> out. table as a rebel who can politic, that my job is to challenge, to tell the truth. I choose because I can and when I can, what meetings I have to attend to and those I don't. If I feel my soul will be crushed or my heart broken, I will not go. If I feel like my spirit will be dulled or my hope dashed, you will not see me at the table. I sit at the table because I am hopeful hopeful for change, but n I never let myself get too comfortable. That's in general, and that is hell. Discomfort makes me move, change, grow, activate, do. So three stories, three observations, three mantras, have give while competing and breaking the rules. Last year at the TCG conference in Boston, I sat in an intergenerational leaders of color meeting and I sat next to Herbert Seguenza of Culture Clash and next to Herbie was Guinan Valdez, behind him was Olga Sanchez from the Miracle, across from us was Evelyn and Jose Luis, and Guinan began the conversation by saying Teatro is reaching 50 years and he wondered if they had fulfilled their mission. Interesting question. And even more interesting was that they had been around for 50 years. <laughs> then Herbie says Culture Clash was over 25 years, and Olga chimes in and said Miracle was 30, and Jose Luis and Evelina, yeah, we're almost 30. Well, we were stunned. It was an epiphany. This was an intergenerational meeting where, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and of color, where there were black companies, Asians, and we had, we had the most experience, the most longevity. And it was the moment I believed we arrived. We arrived at the realization that we had longevity and through struggle we had survived. At that moment, we felt our power. I share an office with Malcolm K. Darrow a young black man who is my associate. And I sent him the LA Times article that recently came out about this meeting today. And it made him sad. He wondered what had happened to the black theater movement. Well, in many ways, black playwrights, not enough, of course, but so many of them have been absorbed at the larger theaters. And, and this is not true of, Latino play, of the Latino playwriting uh, community. Yes, we have had two Pulitzer Prize winners in the last 10 years who have been Latino, but that acceptance nationally has been elusive. 
Now, I observed that what we have turned around and made, and we have made that a positive, we have supported a plethora of small Latino companies throughout the country who produce the work of Latinos for Latinos. And we have done this ourselves and not waited around for someone to do this for us. Yeah. This is our power. Leaders of Color uh, gathering at the TCG conference in Dallas, and a colleague of mine who runs a seminal black theater co uh, company lamented the fact that more large mainstream institutions were producing works of color, particularly black plays. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Did I hear that right? You, are, you have a problem with large theaters producing more works of color? Isn't that what we always wanted? <laughs> Well, in her mind, it was a threat. What was going to happen to her smaller company now that the community was going to go to the larger theaters? And, and this is, I am sure this is a real threat to her. Well, the Latino theater community instinctively redirected the threat of not being produced, and we made it work for us. Now, this is a value we lead in, and we must share this notion of redirection. Now, my advice to my colleague would be to redirect her mission. Produce work that large, larger theaters would never produce. Edgier work. <laughs> Intimate plays. More plays by women. By older artists. <laughs> Find your <laughs> niche. Talk about it. Push it. Promote it. Share it through collaboration. You can only lead if you know your value and organize. What, the, and that's what we're here today doing. Organizing so that the chaos of art making flourishes. I've been on the TCG board for four years. I was vice president last year and now I'm president of the board. <laughs> end of, of where I would be sitting now, which will be at the head of the table, right? And I used to sit at the other end, and I'm going to name names, with Sean San Jose from Campo Santo, Clyde Valentin from the New York Hip Hop Festival, and Mark Valdez was not far away. And, you know, we had fun at the other end of the table with our, with our little side comments and... <laughs> and be all serious and adult <laughs> and on top of it at the other end of the of the of the table while my friends you know continue their coolness at the you know <laughs> the renegade area <laughs> you know so I think I'm gonna this I've decided to make them sit with me oh at the God. other end of the table and take their rightful place. You know, it's like real estate, and in, 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 the, in the words of my, my, my good friend Dan Guerrero, it's location, location, location. <laughs> if you want to sit at the table, and we are beginning to do that, we must be visible, viable, and vocal. So it's not enough to arrive, we must see you and hear you. Now I have to admit, I'm a little nervous about being president, and all I hear is so much work. Oh, it's so much work, but it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and in reality, an opportunity like this comes up, and you have to do it. You, you do do it for yourself, but you do it for your community. And I'm like all of you. You know, I go to the movies, and JD and I, we wait for the credits, and then we count all the Spanish swimmings. <laughs>
Foundation for the Arts National Touring Program, and we give out large grants for touring. And believe me, I look at those videos and I count the peeps of color in, uh, who are applying for money. And the numbers are not good. Where are you guys in the mix? Yes, it's a lot of work to get organized, raising money, taking classes, traveling to see good work so that you can compare yourself to what the field is supporting. But you have to apply for these national opportunities. For you, yes, but for our community. Otherwise, we can't blame anybody for our lack of presence in the national dialogue. We have to be leaders, organized. And yes, it's so much easier sitting at the end of their end of the table making snide comments and being critical, but we've got to get at the other end and take our place. Positioning is everything. And we can do this in our own way. Marcy McMahon recently sent me her book titled Gender, Nation, and Self-Fashioning in U.S. Mexicana and Chicana Literature and Art. She outlines two concepts, one called redirection which, and the other disidentification. And I mentioned how you can redirect a negative into a positive earlier when I mentioned theaters taking on the banner of producing Latino plays when larger theaters were not. Disidentification is interesting in that someone identifies you in a way and you reject that identification and identify yourself in a new and different way. You take back your power. Now, I've been a theater artist for many years since I was a teenager. I started with the teatro in my late teens. We were an activist company, performing at rallies, on picket lines, on dirt, in community centers, living in, I actually lived next to a bar in Gilroy called El Torero. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, traveling all over, we, we traveled all over Europe, we saw international theater, we worked with world-class artists, and this was our life. Now, I did my first movie when I was in the teatro, and it was a Richard Pryor movie called Which Way Is Up, and I played a farm girl, a campesina. I'm throughout the whole movie, but I have no lines, okay? I'm a principal, not an extra, and that experience, that was the beginning of my playing principal roles with no lines, with no voice, as someone mentioned earlier. No voice. So, JD, my husband, and I, we meet in the teatro and we marry, we come to LA in the mid 80s and I began doing, you know, I began working in films and TV and I continue to do principles with no voice. You know, I, I do Terminator 2, La Bamba, I play, you know, the usual, I play prostitutes, I play gang moms, I, I play a couple of, of nuns with lines in Ghost Dad and Psycho 3 and I get cut out of both of those movies. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing, <laughs> The only thing that is left for me in, 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 uh, in Cycle 3 is a snake pit, is in a snake pit in an, an insane asylum, and all you can hear is my voice, help me! <laughs> 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 with her robe of a judge, and I walk in with my maid's costume. And she was so kind. Oh my God. And I, I thought, I, I, I can't tell you, that was 
probably one of the worst moments of, of my acting life. So I get a call from my then partner in Latin's Anonymous, uh, Louisa Lachim. She sees me in, the, in that role. And she says, uh, I saw you on Sunset Beach. And she says, Diane, you know, shouldn't be doing that role. And I, I knew she was right. Not because she and I were judging other actresses playing maids, but because she knew how devastating it was for me, how bad I felt. She also knew I had other means of making a living, much more meaningful ways. Now in Latin Anonymous, we were skewing and satirizing the very roles that we were having to play. And I was living a double, double life, and it didn't feel good. So I quit doing those kinds of roles, and I redirected my career to give myself voice. I took back my power by disidentifying with the image Hollywood gave me. I re-identified myself in the image of my own making. This is within our power to remake, to redirect ourselves and our organizations. I recently wrote an email to many of the LA members of the Alliance about the Opera Luna. Now, they produced my play, Living Large, in a mini kind of way, two years ago in Chicago, and they did a great job producing it, but they lacked the marketing resources to get an audience there. And we've talked a lot about why that was, but in a nutshell, they overextended. Now, they had lost their charismatic founder, Founders who were, and they were struggling to move forward. And, and they've made a lot of mistakes along the way, and as we all do when we're young and inexperienced. But they have drive, and they want to be recognized as a viable group. And I've seen three of their shows, and in each one of them, they have a spirit and energy that, that is infectious, and I think they have something. And when they breezed through t town and they performed in LA, I was taken by the three actresses who I felt were highly capable. The writing was which was solid. Yeah, it needed better buttons, but it was overall very strong, and I was impressed by the audience participation you can see which uses social media. Now, the show was not visually stunning in any way. It was very loosely directed, but that wasn't the point. What struck me was the content that they were saying about either, ser about either seriously, either with seri seriousness or with humor about our lives here in the United States. I imagine that if they planted themselves in a venue for a longer run, the production values of the show would be more polished and would elevate the show. But by going on the road, they were taking their career in their own hands and making it happen the way they wanted it to happen. And I applaud them for that. This is an example of redirection. So what I'm saying is we have the power to redirect na our narrative to take our place at the table and give voice to ourselves and our community. We deserve that. The Afro Luna had content, and they delivered the content with clarity. I'm tired of giving money on panels to national groups or artists who do beautiful, poised work but have no content, who have nothing to say. We have something to say, as witnessed by the, this work that, that we, we, we heard today. From the birth of the Teatro Campesino, Chicano Theater has been about content. The Tenaz Festivals, Tenaz Standing from Teatro Nacional de Aslan, encourage discourse regarding themes and aesthetics. And, that, and this made us better, conscious of the choices we, we were making. This notion of content is what we have to offer U.S. theater. Our narrative needs to be heard, and it is our responsibility to, to plug into the world. If you don't, we remain under the radar. We don't deserve to be underfunded and unrecognized. However, much work needs to be done. The bar needs to be raised in terms of quality of the work. And I'm speaking on all levels, playwriting, producing, marketing, acting, design. I have some very, I've seen some very good work, and then like everything, inconsistent. And we must join national networks like National Performance Network, National Network of Ensemble Theaters, New, New Play Network, Theater Communications Group. We must apply for grants, cap, Creative Capital, New England Foundation of the Arts. 
of National Endowment, uh, the MAP, the NEA, the Irvine, the Mellon. Now, you may say, you know what? Those foundations are completely out of my reach. Well, get them in your reach. You say you've applied for them and you never get them? Well, get panel notes and address the notes. Listen to what people are saying about you, as hard as that may seem. Listen between the lines. Maybe people sense you are under crisis management. Maybe the work isn't competitive. But the more you apply, the more people you know, know will know about your company, or you as an artist, and eventually you will be re rewarded. And, <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna edit myself here. <laughs> I just saw a yawn in the back. <laughs> And the, and the concept which Marisol and her compañera mentioned today, the concept of tu eres mi otro yo. Uh, you know, I, is, there, is there anything? Okay, so you know there's this, um, there's this, the symbol is, it's, um, symbol is this, right? We all know this. And so for me, uh, you know, this is, this is self and this is community. And in the middle is where I believe we live, which is this notion of, 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 of activism. So they combine the, the one line is self and one is community, and they combine to create the space in the middle where, where I live. I live, I am in my community, and my community is me. And we have a re responsibility to hold doors open, to be organized, to be the best, to lead. And leading is about generosity, not self. It's about giving to others. We have to lead. All of you in this room have to lead. We need you. Movements need leaders. We are all working toward a common goal, and we don't need one leader, we need many. And the best leaders are also very good followers. My first full-time year in San Juan Bautista was, with, was the year Peter Brook came to town with his company. And Peter one, was, of course, you know, one of the most revered theater directors of the 20th century. He rolls out the carpet, and we all begin an exploration to see how two very different groups can come to be together to find a common humanity. And it was obviously very quickly that we had a lot in common. And, and there was a heat spell that summer, I, and I, re I remember it very specifically, and I was very fresh out of school wearing very short minis. <laughs> and, I, and I ran around with this English chick who was, you know, uh, in her late 20s, who everyone lusted after, Helen Mirren, and she, and she, you know, taught me a few things about life and acting, and she was the second best actress I'd ever worked with. And Socorro was very competitive with her. <laughs> one very light and one very dark, and, and I... I really, after all these years, regret that Socorro did not continue her career. But because, like me and many other ones of the, others of us, she was tired of not having a voice. Um, he, Peter would have both companies participate in a, in a morning exercise, and for, they were improvisations. And he would say, "When you go onto the carpet, the empty space, if you will." Die. Let yourself die. Kill your ego when you roam into that space and see what you encounter. Frightening. But something we all have to do. The ego stops us. It stops us from really being good. It makes us say no as well. And he was having us say yes to every improvisational encounter. Let go and give. Be generous on the carpet. And he would make us all stand in a line looking forward, barely touching the hairs on each other's arms. And we stood there for however long it took 
until someone started to move. And we couldn't look at each other. But the point was that when Peter was watching, he didn't want to see who was leading. So you would stand there, and, then, and you'd be there forever, and then suddenly somebody starts, you know, moving their arm up, and you're like, who's doing that? And, but you're just following the person next to you. Um, suddenly, the line was moving like a, like a Ouija board, forward and backwards, and, and no one was leading it. It moved by itself. This entity, this tribe, this movement. So many leaders make up a movement, and though you may not see your impact, you are leading. Be leaders in the field. Listen to those who, who you trust so that your work can have the highest quality possible. Leave the security of our communities and have national impact. Share and be generous with our discoveries about sustainability and community. Open your doors and be intergenerational and interracial. We have never been at this point in our history. Take the banner and hold it high. We have arrived and the march begins.
I mean, I'm so 